Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the unadulterated milk of the word like a newborn baby, that you may grow thereby. His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by virtue and glory, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through them we may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Before we open up the word of truth this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you that you have given us your word, that as our Lord prayed in John 17, we realize that it is by means of your word that we grow spiritually. It is not by means of other uh, techniques that are often practiced in churches, but it is by your word that you have empowered your word because it is your word. It is eternally in your mind. It is your word that is alive and powerful. There is nothing that supplants your word, that you have told us that in your word you have given us everything for life and godliness. So, Father, we pray that as we continue our study of how to face life and what face the challenges, the adversities, the heartache, as well as the prosperity and the uh, joys of life from a biblical perspective, we pray that we might be strengthened and encouraged as we study, that we might learn to be more dependent upon you and less influenced by the thinking of the world. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, we're continuing our study, coming out of a verse in Ephesians 4.26 by way of application. So we're looking at these basic spiritual skills that we are to practice and hone and perfect so that we can learn to uh, live the life that Christ has promised us, an abundant life. Doesn't mean it's a life without problems or a life without adversity, but it means that we can live above those negative circumstances and have real peace and stability in our lives, no matter what the external problems may be. We have a an enemy that we deal with every day, and that's our sin nature. And the command in Ephesians 4.26 is one that we have studied and that we need to deal with. But it represents a host of sins that are mental attitude or emotional sins. But mental attitude and emotional sins give birth to sins of the tongue and overt sins. And so we need to understand what are the tools, what are the skills that God has provided for us so that we need not re-enslave ourselves to our sin nature, but learn to deal with these temptations, these tests, by relying upon the Word of God and the Spirit of God so that we can glorify God in our lives. So the command there is be angry and do not sin. To remind you, I said, often we get angry instantly, something happens, but then we, have, we make a choice. Our volition comes into play. Volition means our ability to choose. We are individually responsible for the choices that we make in life, and that volition was one of the first things that was emphasized in the Garden of Eden, as God gave Adam various commands, those commands gave meant, meant that he had the option. It's a binary thing, either to obey or disobey. And we know what eventually happened when he disobeyed God and ate, ate from the fruit. And that plunged the human race into sin. Sin is a corruption of our very nature. 
and we describe this with the term called the sin nature, which is inclined to rebellion against God. And even the good things that we do, and even the good things that people do around us, if they are done from the uh, source of the sin nature, they are spiritually worthless. They may have some value in getting along with other people and uh, making somewhat of a success of our lives, but in terms of eternity, they do not count for anything. In Isaiah, Isaiah writes that all of our, including himself, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Notice that he doesn't say, he's not talking about our unrighteousness. He's not talking about sins per se. He's talking about all of the good things that we do. And it's interesting that the word translated there um, in terms of righteousness is a uh, Hebrew word that is often used to refer to the good works and good deeds in modern Judaism that God's t God takes account of uh, toward their, uh, their salvation. I remember many years ago now, we had a rabbi come visit to talk about the High Holy Days and the Day of Atonement. And though I and other pastors that many of you have listened to over the years have used phrases like, uh, trying a work salvation is like getting brownie points with God, this rabbi actually said on the Day of Atonement, we recognize that God is adding up all the points that we've made. Afterwards, I had so many people come up to me and say, they really believe that. My response was, so you think all of us pastors are liars? You haven't believed us. Things like that are a real important moment in a pastor's life. Do people really listen and believe what we say, or are we just up here entertaining ourselves? Yes, many people think that what they do actually impresses God somehow. But we're told here to be angry and do not sin. Don't act on that anger. Don't, don't carry it out in terms of the various sins that connect with it. And anger is a gateway sin to many mental and emotional sins as well as physical overt sins and sins of the tongue. Bitterness, jealousy, resentment, vengeance, abusive speech, gossip, slander. Uh, emotional abuse, cruelty, physical abuse, violence, uh, innuendo, destroying somebody's character. How many of those things had been characteristic of the items you've watched on the news over the last day or two or month or year? I mean, this tells the story of where our nation is today. The anger that is encouraged by many movements uh, over resentment to uh, where they are financially, so they want to attack the system of free market that doesn't provide for us. So we want to, we, we want equity. Equity guarantees results. They're never the same. Trust me. You know, go to China, go to North Korea, go to uh, Soviet Russia, or even modern Russia, where there there are these attempts to control equal outcomes. They're never they're never equal. You either have equal opportunity or you have equal outcomes, equity, but you can't have both. And so what happens in the movements is that they stir up anger. Uh, anger, you see it in the, um, what is it, the, uh, the, the movement to pay back those who are de descendants of slaves and even those who were never descendants of slaves. You know, that's just motivated by anger. That's not Christian. Bitterness, resentment, revenge, those things are not Christian. We are to be angry, not sin. We may have anger, but we're not going to do bad things with it. So how do we do that? The simplest answer is given in the Psalms. Psalm 119, 11, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, that's as basic and simple as it gets. We are to hide God's word in our heart. There are many different ways that we do that. But by coming to church, coming to Bible class, listening to uh, the lessons online, uh, we have to immerse ourselves into the word so that it can saturate our souls. If the word is not saturating our souls, then we're going to truly struggle in life with 
many circumstances. We do that enough as it is even when we're, we understand the priorities and we're trying to follow them because we live in the devil's world and we have an enemy within. But it is the word. And not only that, they, we are bombarded 24-7 with the devil's message. And we have a problem in that most people, most Christians, as, quote, sincere, unquote, as they appear to be, uh, do not understand that you cannot overcome the brainwashing of the world with just a 15, 20, or 30-minute message a week, not even an hour a week. People play games with God. They give lip service to the priorities, but they don't make them actually their priorities. So I summarize this in basically uh, the three, th three truths that are so much under attack that they bear repeating again and again and again. The first is that we believe the Bible and only the Bible has the answer. The Bible and only the Bible is the eternal omnipotent power of God. It represents him. That's why 2 Peter 1.3 starts, his divine power has given to us some things. That's what people hear. They don't, it's radical to say all things, and especially to live like it. All things pertaining to what? To life and godliness. How do you get that? Through knowledge. You have to learn things. Now, we know in this congregation, because you've heard me say it many times, that information is not knowledge, and knowledge is not wisdom. It is information to understand that avocados and tomatoes are fruits. It is knowledge to know that you don't put them in a fruit salad. It is wisdom to mix them together and make guacamole. So many people confuse in our information age the information that they have to be knowledge and that somehow is wisdom and that's just self-deception. God says it's through the knowledge of what? It's in, through the knowledge of Him. Who's Him? He is the one who called us by glory and virtue. Now, if this is referring to God, and it is, that's a first-class condition, then we have to spend some time learning who he is. The only way you get that information is by studying the Bible, reading the Bible again and again and again. You, you, we all forget it rapidly. That's part of our sin nature's role is to eradicate Scripture in our brain, I think. It, it, it's easy for us to overcome it with rationalizations. But we have to know who God is. We have to start there. And that starts as the creator in Genesis 1-1. And it's a lifetime process. And he called us by glory and virtue. That, those two terms basically summarize the essence of God. And it is by which, by which glory and virtue, by which refers to his essence, the attributes of God, who he is, that he has given us exceedingly great and precious promises. And these promises are what you use if you're going to claim a promise to trust God in the midst of an, adver an adversity. You need to know the Word. Um, we are going to be coming out with a new channel on YouTube, and that should be launched when? Next week. It's called Light from Light. And starting with the third episode, I'm starting to go through the promises in the promise book one by one in order, explaining the context and explaining each one and encouraging people to memorize these promises. So we'll give you more information on that as we go along, but it's something to work on. It is through these great and precious promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. That doesn't mean we become gods or little gods. What it means is that our, uh, the process of our sanctification is to conform us to the image of Christ, spiritual growth, the fruit of the Spirit. 
And so we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust because we have been regenerated. So the Bible is it. We don't go to a lot of other sources to find how to handle problems because we have the book on how to handle problems. Romans 12, 2 says, and I, par- I wrote this out as a paraphrase of an, a translation, do not be pressed into the mold of your culture's values and methodology. When you were regenerate, even if you were young like I was at the age of six, I was already to a large degree conformed to the uh, values of the world around us. That's just the nature. The sin nature absorbs it rapidly. It shapes our personality, shapes our values. So we're not to be pressed into that mold. We are to be transformed by the total renovation of how and what you think. You've been brainwashed by the world, and you have to go through a a, a deprogramming. And that's what happens in Bible class. We are to be deprogrammed. We're not going to solve problems the way the world says. We have to do it on the basis of God's Word. And that is evidence in the angelic revolt, and it demonstrates that God's will, that's what's in the Scripture, is good and acceptable and complete. That's the sufficiency of Scripture, a much-ignored doctrine today. Third, I said the world system, the spirit of the age, which we refer to as human viewpoint or or, uh, demonic viewpoint, is the way of the sin nature. And it's in direct conflict of the Word of God. So it's a binary choice all the time. God's way or man's way. That's it. You don't have other options. God's way or the devil's way. God's way or your own personal sin nature's way. That's it. The way that seems right to man, it's the end thereof is death. Proverbs 14, 12 and 16, 25. And to turn away from the Lord is the fountain of life takes you to the snares of death. So we're looking at these basic spiritual skills to solve problems. We have to understand that we have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we have choice, volition. It depends on your choice. Your life is the result of your choices. Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. We have to make that choice every single day between human viewpoint solutions that come from the sin nature and divine viewpoint solutions that come from God's Word. Psalm 119.50, This is my comfort in my affliction, for your Word has given me life. Nothing takes the place of internalizing, assimilating, and getting saturated with the Word of God. Nothing is more important. This is the message in Scripture going back to Genesis. At the end of the Pentateuch, the challenge from Moses to the Israelites as they prepare to enter into uh, the Promised Land is he has set before them life and death, blessing and cursing, Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. So what we're looking at is the spiritual skills that we need to have life. And so because there's certain fluidity in those who come and those who don't come due to various factors, including uh, sickness and whatever, it's necessary to have a little review. How do we have life? How do we solve these problems? We have to know the Word. This all comes out of the Word. It's just organized and systematized in a nice way. The first, it has to do with the fact that God has provided with us the fact that He is a fortress. We see this many, many passages, especially in the Psalms, that we, we actually sort of build this fortification in our soul. What does Paul pray in, in Ephesians 3? The Ephesian believers may be strengthened in the inner man. That's what we're talking about here. What strengthens us spiritually? And we have to practice these skills. So it takes a lifetime, number one. Number two, it's piecemeal and dynamic. It, it, it's not just something you can go read and do 10 things and you have it and that's it. 
it takes a lifetime of practice, just like any skill. And by utilizing these skills, it enables us to stay inside that protective barrier that God's given us. He's, scripture uses terms like he's our high tower, he's our shield, he is our fortification, um, he's our defense. All of these indicate what God has provided for us. And when we don't use the skills and as we face adversity, we default to the sin nature. And the sin nature basically creates more problems. And as long as we keep trying to solve the, pro the problems we face through the sin nature, it, it leads to a pattern of just self-destruction. So we either live in this old fortress, which is equivalent to walking by the Spirit, being filled by the Spirit, walking in the truth, walking in the light, living on the basis of God's Word, or we're outside and we are walking according to the flesh. So we have all these arrogant skills we perfected by the time we were probably two years old. Have you ever met a two-year-old that wasn't self-absorbed? He is the center of his world. And when he is 60 years old, he still is. And that destroys the soul so that it is fractured and fragmented. You know, psychology comes along and says, well, we have a problem with neurosis. Well, if psychosis is the, the definition of psychosis or, or neurosis is that you have, you know, created this, this um, fantasy world and a psychotic is one who moves in and lives as if it's reality, then we're all psychotic. Because once we turn away from God, which because of the sin nature is instantaneous, we are no longer worshiping the creator, we're worshiping the creature. And that is living in a fantasy world that there, as if there's no creator. I mean, that's a, that's a denial of reality from the get-go. So, so we, we don't really go through that neurotic stage. We're just basically psychotics to one degree or another, divorced from reality. And the only solution is the cross. So we have our positional truth in Christ, and then we have our daily walk where we're wa walking by the Spirit. That's what I mean by this soul fortress. It's living in that circle. So... So fortress principles, Psalm 18.2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. The word for fortress is Masada. The fortress of Masada is what's in the picture. God is our fortress, our deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation. He's my stronghold. How do we get there? Well, when we have sinned, we need to recover, and that's confession. We talked about it last time. It's very simple. It means simply to admit or acknowledge our sin to God. We looked at various passages. Psalm 32, 5 uses that language. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And that idea of forgiveness is what's necessary. We have to get forgiven to get back inside the soul fortress, to start walking in the light, walking by means of the Spirit, being filled by the Spirit. Otherwise, we're still living on the basis of our sin nature. So the result of confession is total forgiveness. God forgives us of the sins we didn't mention, the sins we didn't know, know the sins that we really uh, like to hold on to. He wipes the slate clean. He uh, forgives us of our, all our unrighteousness. And Psalm 103, 12, he re removes it as far as the east is from the west. So many people have guilt feelings about so many things they've done in the past. But if you're a Christian, that's another sin because you're not believing that God forgave you and, and he's forgotten those sins. In Isaiah 43, I even I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Now, God's omniscience, and at one level, he remembers them. But what this means is he's not going to hold that against you. He's not going to come along 30 years later and say, you know, I still remember what you did when you were in the third grade. And you're still having some divine discipline for that. That's not what's going on. That's grace. 1 John 1, 9. 
we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, or faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. The Lord doesn't listen efficiently, effectively to every prayer. In fact, there are places in Jeremiah where God tells the Israelites, I'm not going to listen to you. Discipline is coming. So the re instant result of that is that we are back in right relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, we're filled by the Spirit. There's a couple of phrases that are used in the New Testament that are basically synonymous. One is walking by means of the Spirit. The Spirit is the means or instrument by which we walk. Walking is our moment-by-moment -moment walk in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And we won't bring to completion the lust of the flesh. What that means is, it's like when Peter's walking on the water. As long as he looked at Jesus, he wasn't going to sink beneath the waves. But what happened? He got his eyes on the waves. And as soon as he took his eyes off the Lord, what happened? He defaults into the water. And that's what we do. We default to the sin nature. And we're either living according to the flesh or we live according to the Spirit. That's, those are walking, living, these are synonyms. We're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit. That's what happens when we sin. That's in the context of what we're studying. But we are to be filled by means of the Spirit. I just touched on this at the end last time, but I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this. Why does it say, do not be drunk with wine? Wine is viewed in that first paragraph. The gramma grammar is the same in the two, two phrases, two, two lines. Wine is the means for getting inebriated. Why were they getting inebriated? And what's the significance of wine? Well, one of the cults in the ancient world, mystery cult, was the worship of Dionysius, Bacchus in the Roman. He was what? The god of what? He's the God of wine. How do you get close to the God of, God of wine? You get a lot of wine and you drink it. And you get inebriated so that the God can enter into you. And how did they know that God was in them? They spoke in ecstatic utterance. Now I see a few light bulbs go on as to what's going on in the background. So you have to understand the culture that they were dealing with. And so they would, go, they would worship Dionysius by going up into these groves in the hills, and they would uh, drink and dance and have an orgy, and that was all because the god Dionysius entered into them. So that was how they got spiritual. That's how they got close to God. But Paul draws a contrast. He says, it's not by means of wine, uh, which is dissipation. That means which is emptiness. It doesn't get you anything. It's a waste of time. And he says, be filled by means of the Spirit. That's the contrast. Are you going to get close to God by walking by the Spirit or not? Filling of the Spirit is not the main command, I believe, between walking by the Spirit and being filled by the Spirit. I think you're filled by the Spirit when you're walking by the Spirit. When you walk by the Spirit, the Spirit is going to fill you with God's Word. And we know that because we compare it to other passages. Ephesians 5.18 says, don't be drunk with wine, which I just said, but be filled by means of the Spirit. What's the result? You have a series of participial clauses from the next several verses, but just verse 19 gets the point across. The result, one of the first results he mentions is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, I know there are Christians who don't like to sing. Guess what, folks? That's a sign that you are walking by the Spirit. So if you say, oh, I'm just going to stand here with my mouth shut, you need to let the Word of God change your mind. One of the results of being filled by means of the Spirit is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, some people try to say, well, see, that doesn't mean I have to sing out loud because I'm supposed to do it in my heart. 
Well, see, if you're doing it in a heart, you're going to do it out loud. That's, it's going to the source of the issue. Uh, that's the way the Bible writes. A lot of times it uses, um, it uses phrases uh, and idioms where the one part will put for the result. And so if you're making melody in your heart to the Lord, the result is it's going to come out of your mouth. So you can't use that to rationale to hide behind it and not sing. But look at the parallel passage in Colossians 3.16. The command is given in that first line. I'm going to skip it. The result of that command is with wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. To the, to God. So what we see is the same results are in Colossians 3.16 as in Ephesians 5.19. The command's a little different. The command is to let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. In Ephesians, Paul is dealing with uh, the, the means. In Colossians, he's dealing with the content. But the, if the results of action A are identical with the results of action B, then actions A and B go together. They're two sides of the same coin. When we walk by means of the, of the Spirit, or we are filled by means of the Spirit, what are we filled with? It doesn't say. Colossians 3.16 tells us we're filled with the Word of God. It is the Holy Spirit who helps us to understand and remember, and He stores the Word of God in our soul, so that when we need it, He will bring it to mind. So this is the idea here. Walking by the Spirit. That's why in the diagram I have uh, FHS, filling by the Spirit, and WHS, because they go together. They're talking about the same thing. It is that ongoing partnership. And some few years back, I ran across an outstanding article that was written in the early 30s about the meaning of koinonia, the word translated fellowship, in which... The author makes the case, which I think was done very well, that fellowship wasn't just social interaction. It is two people involved in a common, common act moving toward a common goal. Well, when two people are moving toward a common goal, we usually say they're walking together. So the idea of walking by the Spirit, walking in the light, walking in the truth is a perfect uh, metaphor for fellowship. It's a synonym for it. So that's what we have here. You're walking by the Spirit, and this, by, while you're doing that, the Spirit works in us with the Word of God. Uh, Galatians 5.16 gives that command, walk by means of the Spirit. So to summarize it, when we're walking, living moment by moment, by means of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit fills us with the Word of Christ so that it can richly dwell within us and produce spiritual growth, spiritual transformation, uh, renovate our thinking, and develop the fruit of the Spirit, which is the character of Christ in us. That summarizes it. But if you're not walking by the Spirit, you're walking by the flesh. And if you don't confess sin, you're still walking according to the sin nature, which explains a lot of bad theology. But that's the key. So we have to walk by the Spirit. So we confess sin, and as an immediate consequence, we are back in right relationship with God the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you stay there? You ever wonder about that? When you're a baby believer, you're going to be in and out like it's a revolving door because you haven't learned much. Remember in uh, 2 Peter 1.3 says it's by knowledge of him. So you have to learn a few things. If you don't learn anything, nobody ever teaches anything, and you just go to a church where you hear the gospel every Sunday and get saved every Sunday, then you're not going to do anything but construct a revolving door and go, go around and around and around. But how do you stay there? How do you continue? We do that by understanding the Word of God. 
And when we face adversity, what we do is we claim promises. And claiming a promise is basically saying, God, you said this. You promised that you would do this. And I'm going to hold you to it. And right now, I'm going to claim this promise. And I am going to hold you to that, that you will sustain me in the midst of temptation, in the midst of adversity. And so that's basically what's involved. We can break it down where we start with a verse or maybe part of a verse that we remember. And that is a that relates to a promise or a principle. And then we mix it with faith, trusting in God. We have verses for each one of these. So this isn't just some sort of theological deduction. Each is supported by specific texts of Scripture. And then we do what it says to do. Now, what it says to do may involve a mental attitude, our focus, our dependence upon, uh, upon the Scripture, our dependence upon the Holy Spirit. So it may be a mental attitude uh, application. It may be an emotional application where we're not going to let emotions control us. It may have something to do with communication, what comes out of our mouth. Uh, it is control of the tongue that is so difficult. And then the fourth thing is that we are to relax in God's provision and oversight. We rest in his promise. Doesn't mean that we stop doing everything, that you just become a passive believer and you lie down and wait for God to do everything. You do what God says to do and rest in God's provision. And so you don't give in to worry and fear and anger and anxiety and these other em emotional sins. So we have passages. This is just a tremendous uh, passage in Psalm 56. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. Verse 4 says, in God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? Now you can substitute a number of other things like anger or jealousy or whatever in terms of sins, but here it's talking about fear. Ran across a fascinating story of application of this recently. There was a missionary couple in China uh, back before uh, the, uh, or dur actually during the beginnings of uh, World War II when the Japanese had invaded uh, China. And they had two children and they lived in the inland town of Shenku. The village was totally given over to panic and fear because the Japanese were approaching and the Japanese were awful, violent, destructive soldiers and so the people were scared to death. The couple of missionary, the missionary couple lived there were Dick and Margaret Hillis. And at this particular time, Dick developed appendicitis. He had to go to a medical facility. The closest was a long journey, and he had to travel by rickshaw to get there. And he left on January the 15th of 1941. His wife with the two young children watched him leave. Pretty soon the Chinese commanding officer came to them and said that the enemy is near and all of the people in the town need to evacuate. But she knew that she could not take her one-year-old Johnny and two-month-old Margaret Ann to be refugees. She would have to stay put. The next morning, she went to her calendar. It's one of these calendars that had a Bible verse for every day, and she tore the page off, and the passage for that day was Psalm 56.3. So she claimed that promise. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. By the end of the day, she was the, about the only one left in the town. She got up the next morning feeling quite abandoned and distraught and fighting feelings of panic and fear. The verse for that day was Psalm 9, verse 10. Thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. That day went by, and she's going about what she can, concerned, worried about 
the distant sons, sounds of gunfire and worrying about how she's going to take care of her two babies. And the verse for that day was Genesis 50, verse 21. I will nourish you and your little ones. There was a knock on the door, and there was an old woman who had a pail of eggs that she left her, as well as some goat's milk. Throughout the day, the sounds of warfare grew more intense. She prayed these promises. The next day, she looked at Psalm 56, 9. When I cry unto thee, then shall my enemies turn back. As the battle loomed closer, she couldn't sleep that night. She stayed awake praying. Invasion and capture seemed imminent, but the next morning it was all quiet. Villagers began to return. The colonel knocked on her door and said that for some unknown reason the Japanese had retreated. That doesn't always happen. God has different plans for different people. But we need to claim God's, plan, God's promises and trust in Him. Psalm 56, 11 says, In God I will put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So we need to trust in the Lord. The psalm goes on to say, When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. We have three enemies in the Christian life. The enemies are Satan, who is our adversary, in 1 Peter 5, 7 through 11. We have the enemy of the world system, the cosmic system, the way of thinking of the world that constantly tries to press us into its mold. And we have the enemy uh, not only of the world, but we have the enemy of our sin nature, which is a traitor to us, constantly uh, telling us that the world has a better way. And we have to learn to put our trust in God and in his word. But if you don't know his word, you can't do that. Hebrews 4.2 is talking about the disobedient, rebellious Exodus generation that, went, that encountered divine discipline because they wouldn't trust God to go into the promised land. And the writer of Hebrews says, For indeed the gospel, the Old Testament gospel, was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. See, that's where that second principle comes from. We have to mix our faith with the Word of God. And if we don't do it, we're sunk. Psalm 5, 11, and 12, But let all those who rejoice put their trust in you. That word for trust there means to take refuge. And so metaphorically it means to trust. And that is the idea there. We put our trust in Him because God is our refuge. So let all those who put their trust or seek refuge in, in you, let them shout for joy because you defend them. That's the idea of the soul fortress. It's our defense. For you, O Lord, o Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. The word for defense is the word uh, saka, which basically means a covered structure designed to give protection. Psalm 16, 1, we have the prayer, Preserve me, O God, for in you I put my trust. That's a quick, short promise. God will preserve us. The idea of preserve is an interesting word. It is the word shamar, which means to uh, guard something, to keep something, to watch over it, uh, to preserve it. Uh, that's the idea of, of uh, protection. God is worthy of our trust. He will preserve us. He will protect us. He will provide for us. The word here for trust is that same word to take refuge. We find that same word again in the psalm I quoted earlier in 18.2 that talks about God as our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, uh, in whom we, I will trust. I will take refuge in him, in the fortress. Psalm 25, 2 and 20. Oh my God, I will trust, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let my, not my enemies triumph over me. Remember our three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. This is a different word for trust. It's batach, which has the idea of confidence. 
certainty that God will answer our prayers. In verse 20, we have the same word, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. See, there's an argument there. An argument in the sense of putting forth a case for someone to do something. You're not just saying, God, I trust you, save me. You're saying, God, you don't want me to embarrass by your failure to provide for me. That's what he's saying. He's making a case for God to protect him because if not, God will be ridiculed for not protecting me. So I'm 62.8. Batak again, confidence. Trust in him with confidence. At all times, you people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Psalm 25, 2, O Lord, I trust in you. I think I just read that. Verse 3, Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Waiting is often connected to hope. We wait on the Lord. We wait for him to act. We don't try to solve it ourselves and get impatient. This is very, very important. Psalm 37, 3, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. That's taking in the word, remembering what he has said, remembering how God has uh, taken care of you in the past. Delight yourself in the Lord. Uh, that is the idea there in delighting in the Lord is making him a source of joy, making him a priority in your life. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. Verse 5 says, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. The word translated commit is the word gul or galal in Hebrew, and it means to commit or trust or to roll something away. When I was growing up, we sang a Bible chorus, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. Jim is mouthing the words because we all sang those when we were young, and we taught them to kids. All my burdens of my soul rolled away. That comes from this verse. Those are great Bible choruses based on, based on Scripture. Psalm 115, 11 says, You who fear the Lord, trust, batak, have confidence in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Psalm 55, 22, Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be saved. That word for cast is a vivid image. It's the word shalak in Hebrew, which means to like throw a spear. It means to cast something onto something else. We're to throw our burdens upon the Lord. It's that same idea of ro rolling something onto the Lord. That is why it's translated cast. In the New Testament, we have 1 Peter 5, 7, which is really carrying out the previous command to humble yourself. How do we do that? By casting all of our care upon him, our worries, our fears, our anxieties, our doubts. We cast all our care on him because he cares for you. You're going to go through times in your life when you're going to be doing that every 30 seconds. The other 30 seconds are confessing the sin of worry and anxiety again. And then you start praying about it again. And, and that's how we grow. We've all gone through that, and sometimes we're, we still go through that when we go through really serious times. We just have to be reminded of it. We are to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and not lean on our own understanding. You don't want to go to the world's way of doing things. It's, we're not going to rely on human viewpoint, which is the devil's way of doing things. We're not going to be pressed into the mold of the world and do it in terms of our own understanding. We're going to trust in the Lord and his word. But if you don't know the word, you have nothing to trust. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. All the time. He is the one who leads got us out of Ukraine just about a year ago. Jeremiah sums up the contrast in Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. Thus says the Lord, not my words, the Lord's words. Cursed is the man who has confidence in human beings and their philosophies. That's my paraphrase. 
Cursed is the man who trusts in man. Well, what does that mean? It means don't put your confidence in human beings and their philosophies. And makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. When you do that, your heart has departed from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. Interesting word for desert here. It's the word Arabah. If you've been to Israel, if you've gone to that area down in the uh, desert of Judea that extends south of the Dead Sea, where it is just parched and absent of all water, that's the Arabah. So you'll become like a shrub in the Arabah, parched, shriveled, thirsty, nothing. And that's why the next images mean so much. You shall not see good when it comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. But blessed is the man who confidently trusts in the Lord, whose confident expectation is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. When we confess our sins, we are back inside the soul fortress. God the Holy Spirit is the one with whom we walk, and it puts up that first tower in the corner, the faith rest drill. So in conclusion, what we learn here is we have two choices. One choice, actually. It's binary. Some people say, oh, that's too simplistic. You just think in terms of black and white. God thinks that way. Darkness, light, all through the scriptures. You either trust in God or you trust in flesh. You trust in man. You trust in human viewpoint. There's either God's way or man's way. Man's way is what we're supposed to do because that's what the world says. This is how you handle that problem. But the scripture says that you need to learn the word of God. You need to know God and you need to know his promises and you need to develop that knowledge because you have to have knowledge before you can have wisdom. And some people, they may be teenagers, they may be college kids, they're facing decisions that will shape the rest of their life. The trouble is, for the most part, they don't have the knowledge to have the wisdom and they get overwhelmed Then they spend the rest of their life dealing with it. You have a lot of adults in their 50s, 60s, and 70s are dealing with the consequences of decisions they made when they were 15, 16, 17, or 18 because they didn't have the Word of God. But God's grace gets us through it. You know, it's not like you're, you're, you're stuck there. But you're going to have those consequences, but you can live above those consequences because now you have wisdom. But how do you get wisdom? You have to learn the Word. You have to saturate your soul with the Word. Well, I have to work, and I have to do this, and I have to do this with my kids, and I have to do this other thing, and I have all these demands, and I have to go to school and work. So, you realize that many of the great theologians in life had demands like that. Many of the great spiritual heroes had demands like that because that's what happens in the world. The devil's always using these circumstances to give us a rationale for not being where we should be or doing what we should do. So that's the choice. Are we going to walk by the Spirit? Are we going to walk by the sin nature? Father, thank you for this opportunity we've had to be challenged with your word, learning what it means to walk by the Spirit, to trust you, to claim promises, to internalize your word. It's radical. But the difference between your way and man's way is radical. And we need to learn that if it's going to count for eternity, if it's going to make a difference between being a a living in a parched desert or living uh, an abundant life in a uh, richly watered, prosperous area, the difference is those decisions we make. Pray that you would challenge us with these realities. 
And then, Father, we pray for any who may be listening for the first time or tw- tenth time, and they've never trusted Christ as Savior. They've always heard that you need to do this or do that, uh, some form of legalism, that it's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift provided by you uh, based on the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins, paid the penalty for our sins, so that when we recognize and believe that Jesus died for my sins, we realize that that forgiveness and we have eternal life. It's a gift to simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we will be saved. So Father, we pray that we will not forget what we have learned, but be reminded how important it is to be saturated with your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to ask Mark Reisinger to come up and dismiss us in closing prayer. Let's bow as we close our service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you that you've provided all that we need. You've promised. You've been faithful throughout our lives. Um, You will continue to do so. We thank you for the stories of the missionaries and others who have been serving you faithfully that can come and encourage us and strengthen our faith. We thank you for your provision that is already ahead of us, and we ask that you would help us this week to walk with you, filled with the Holy Spirit, to share that with those around us, and to allow your word to strengthen us in our inner man. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.